I love that. I can see more of you. Hi, Angela. Hi, Laura. <laughs> it's good to see you guys here. So um, we're going to be diving into the mysteries of Hathor today. And let me pull up the chat window just in case people are here saying anything there. Um, does that, how many of you are familiar with Hathor? Like you work, like you've connected to this goddess before, you've worked with her, you've, um, you've even just heard of Hathor before. And uh, you could either raise your hand or you could like type in the chat box if you've had contact with Hathor, worked with this goddess. She's not as popular actually as some other ones. So we've got M saying yes. Rushian says nope, never. Okay. Um, Argante, I don't know if I'm saying your name right. Argante says, I've been working with Hawthorne since 1981. Oh, yes. So we've got a pro here. Okay. Natalina says, absolutely. Michelle says, I've worked with her only in Oracle cards. Okay. So we have um, quite a range of experiences in, in my I think in my, in my opinion, she is a, uh, like a lesser known goddess. I think a lot of times when we think about like the main goddess in ancient Egypt, we think about the goddess Isis. If we're really, you know, Isis sort of came after Hathor. So she's closer to our age of time. I don't know if this is, I'm being spotlighted here or not. Um, so one of the things that I'd really like to do for you guys today is reintroduce you to this ancient Egyptian mother of civilization itself. And we're going to be doing three things on the call today. Number one, you're going to be getting an introduction to Hathor. Who, who she is, what, what her symbolism is, what her archetypes are. It's going to be like a little, like a, like a taste, because let me tell you, Hathor is very, very, very deep. She, there are a lot of levels. There are a lot of levels of this goddess, and there's a lot of levels to the consciousness that she uh, sort of represents and, you know, who's to say what these goddesses actually are. They can even, you know, we've got people like Tom Kenyon. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Tom Kenyon's work. He channels a group of beings known as the Hathors that he says, you know, were, were well, the Hathors say they were working through, you know, the cult of Hathor and the, the goddess temples of Hathor back in those times. So, you know, we can have a lot of different spiritual beings or spiritual energies that are actually behind a lot of these mystery schools and a lot of these traditions. Um, and amongst introducing you to Hathor, one of the things that I'm going to, the second thing we're going to cover today is an introduction to the the mystery school and really the the spiritual path that underlies this particular goddess and again the the, the spiritual path is also beyond the goddess herself so it's beyond hathor it's beyond egypt it's beyond you know you can find this spiritual path in every culture you can find this spiritual path on every planet even you can find it throughout the galaxy throughout the cosmos you know when we're when we're talking more about the the spiritual path we're talking about you know the journey of the soul and we're talking about how the process of uh self-realization is um is occurs and there are a few there's like there's like 
you know, there's it really every soul has their own unique path back to the infinite. But there are kind of like these main thoroughfares where it's like, okay, these souls are on that path. These souls are on the path of, you know, you know, they're on the path of like sacred scriptures and knowledges. They're like the scribes. They're like the ones like writing all the ancient, writing and studying the ancient texts. Like these are the souls that are on, you know, the path of the heart, the path of divine love, you know? So we kind of have these thoroughfares that are wide and they, and it's like, okay, now here's how a, a huge group is coming to the divine. And those are the spiritual paths. And so the Hathor Mystery School is a manifestation of, I call it the Venus path. So in our solar system, Venus is the divine, you know, it's the divine feminine planet. So this is the, what I also sometimes call it the divine feminine path of self-realization. And I prefer using either like the divine feminine path of self-realization or the Venus path. I prefer using that as opposed to using something like Tantra or something like Bhakti Yoga or, some, or something like, you know, a goddess-based spirituality because all of those things like Tantra you know, it's a very specific tradition in India and it's not exactly the same as the Venus path, even though the Venus path has elements of Tantra in it. And Bhakti Yoga, the yoga of love, the yoga of devotion is very, very similar. It's very, very, very similar to, it's probably of all, it's the most similar to the Venus path, except that um, I think with bhakti yoga, there is a lot less of an emphasis on worship of the goddess. It's more worship of um, it's more worship of the beloved. Usually, it's worship of, of like a masculine deity, like Krishna or Jesus. Christianity is a bhakti path. So, um, so this is different because uh, we go through the divine mother really to reach the beloved. And it's different than a lot of just plain old goddess, kind of neo-pagan, like nature goddess spirituality traditions, because it's it's not just a pure worship of nature either. So that's where, you know, the second part of this call is going to be focused on is introducing you to what the Venus path is and introducing you to the, 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 the mystery school really that underlies the goddess herself and how progress on that path, how, how you make spiritual progress on that path of, uh, of Venus or that, that divine feminine path of self-realization. And so I want to be clear when I say divine feminine, uh, please know that that does not mean, oh, this is just a spiritual path for women or those who identify as women. There were absolutely male priests devoted to Hathor. There are absolutely uh, male aspirants in, in this mystery school. So, um, when I refer to the divine feminine and we'll get into this a little more, I'm referring to the energy in the universe and in all of us that is feminine and that energy correlates. Well, we're going to get, I don't want to get you know, give you a, a bunk. I've got a whole presentation <laughs> plan for you today, but that, that energy correlates to a lot of things. And, and this is really a mystery school that is devoted to honoring, worshiping, loving the sacredness of the feminine, you know, what that feminine, that, that, that mother energy is really about. And the mother energy is 
just one expression of it, okay? So we're gonna get into that today. And then the third thing that I'm really, I'm gonna be covering on this call is more the history of, you know, you know, the Akashic history. I, I like to call it the lost history of the goddess temples, the lost history of the temples of Hathor and those who served her and those who loved her. And um, many of you are likely uh, souls that that had a, a deep connection to her because that was the intention in my heart and the calling in my heart when I put this together was bring me, like bring me the priests, like bring me her priestesses, like bring them to me. And please know that in a lot of timelines, we weren't even called priests or priestesses, we were called prostitutes. So if you're new to my work, um, I didn't even introduce myself. My name is Akara Sophia, also known as Kara Gilligan. And um, I, I really like to teach the path of the sacred prostitute. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, I think, confusion around this path in our you know, modern world. The, the word prostitute actually comes from the Greek word to prostrate, which means to bow before, right? To, to, to lay, to surrender, to bow before the altar or to bow before the temple. So, you know, that word in our lexicon has been inherited from the Greek word for prostitutes, which that was a name for what we would call a sacred vassal, which would essentially be a priest or a priestess of um, one of the temples in the ancient world. So I like to reclaim that word. I like to reclaim it in the power of the Divine Mother. I like to reclaim it as something to wear with pride as something to you know not have any shame about and i when i use that word i'm using it in substitute for priestess or in substitute for priest and to me using that word instead of using priest or priestess it does a num it does a couple of things that i find really important which hathor is going to teach you about which is that it reminds us that the path of divine service is not divorced from the realms of the body and sexuality and money in particular. I mean, what do we associate prostitute with? We associate, we associate a prostitute as, as somebody who sells their body or sell, you know, trades their body in exchange for money. So it's, a, it's an archetype that's very connected to these shadow realms that have to do really with sex and money or materialism. And um, when I use that word, I'm using it to remind you that, you know, we're, I'm using it to help clear some of the Judeo-Christian programming, which was that age of renunciation that we all went through for the last 2000 years to remind you that service to the divine, that, um, that being authentic to your spiritual path in life is not separate from the, your, the, from your sexuality. So your sexuality is sacred. It's not separate from your body. Your body is sacred and it's not separate from money and matter. That material reality is also sacred material, it, you know, mother, ma matter, mother. Okay. And so that's why I use that word. So those are the three things we're going to cover. Goddess Hathor, Venus Mystery School, the wounds of sacred prostitution and how to clear them. And I just wanna welcome you if you are here. We have this really, really beautiful new moon uh, tonight. Uh, it is the new moon in Taurus, which is Hathor's sacred sign. 
So this is the astrological sign of the, the bull, uh, the astrological sign that is really deeply connected. It's an earth sign. It's deeply connected to uh, sensuality and abundance and sort of like a practical, earthy, grounded mysticism. And the time that we're going to be talking about in today's call or the time of the, the, the worship of the Great Mother, where this was very pervasive, not just in Egypt, but all around the world and where we saw a lot of, you know, worship of the cow or worship of the bull gods, gods during this age of Taurus, which was you know, before the 2000 years of Christianity and the dark ages and the middle ages, the fall of the Roman empire, it was before the 2000 years before that of like the Roman empire and the age of Aries and a lot of war and a lot of conquest and Moses and the rise of monotheism and, you know, the, kind of focus on more the male god that came in then we're actually talking about another age that is you know between 4 to 6000 years ago which in our current like t what you what gets taught in school you know they say that was the beginning of civilization now i'm going to give you guys a different timeline here cuz in my opinion, <laughs> I work with the Akashic Records. I'm a channel for the Akashic Records. So, you know, we've got some gaps <laughs> in our understanding of human evolution. But it was a time where, you know, the civilization was uh, flourishing, okay? This was the time when the pyramids were built. It was a time when you know, there was this, these wonderful, powerful cultures in, you know, Sumeria and Babylon and Egypt and, you know, where, where the, the birth of this kind of what is today, like more the empire culture came from in, and what I call sort of like the bedrock of Western civilization was there. So we're going to be journeying into this time and understanding that this was actually a time where there was a very powerful, still people had a very, very powerful connection to the earth during this time. They had a very, very powerful connection to the Divine Mother during this time. And Hathor, even though she existed later and she existed up into the age of you know, Aries and the Roman Empire, she was uh, losing a lot of power during those times. It was more Isis who came forward. Isis is very different from Hathor. If you're really into the Egyptian canon, you know, Isis is more the perfect wife, the perfect mother. She's like what Hathor became once, once, when all of a sudden now the feminine was being defined by her relationship to the masculine. This was the rise of, you know, divine, you know, monotheism, masculine gods, all of this stuff. And so her frequency changed and she became more of like, Isis is more of like, the devote, you know, the devotion to the masculine, even though that she has a lot of the same qualities of Hathor, when we're going back to Hathor's time, you know, Hathor, you'll notice she's like the only Egyptian god that's shown full face. All the other Egyptian gods are profile, right? They're all, you know, two-dimensional. Yet Hathor and the sculptures of Hathor show her full, full detailed face. Look at that bumblebee. <laughs> That's like definitely a Hathor, <laughs> like sacred, like Hathor sacred um, animal. So Hathor, we're talking about a time when, you know, the goddess was seen as sovereign. You know, this was, this is like a different timeline than like what we can even process in our minds today. And if you think about, you know, the evolution of mankind and you think about how, you know, we 
we rose from being more these wild indigenous cultures that were, you know, very, 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 very connected to nature. The original God, so to speak, that human beings, you know, saw as being the, 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 the main I, I, deity was the mother. It was, it was Mother Earth. It was, you know, what Hathor is, the Mother Sky, you know, the, the whole cosmos itself. So this is a time where people saw the creator as, as being female. People saw God itself as being feminine. And so we're really sinking into a very, very different perspective of reality when we start connecting to Hawthor. Now, Hawthor is interesting because even though she is the cosmos and even though she is Mama Earth and even though she is, you know, everything, uh, you know, about, you know, this, this, this beautiful, abundant creation that we live in and the source of it, um, she's not just purely a nature goddess. And that's what we're going to get into. If you guys are on the call, you probably um, came here from some of what I've put out over, you know, the last few days around Hathor being the mother of civilization and how the sacred cow is uh, really, you know, the, sim the symbol of Hathor. And, um, and, and what does that symbol represent? That symbol represents our transition evolutionarily speaking, from the Paleolithic um, hunter-gatherer, kind of wild, more like small tribes, uh, migrant, small migrant tribes, kind of wandering the, the, the back of the earth and that stage of our evolution to when, you know, human beings learned how to tame animals and plant crops and they started to farm. Okay, so they started to farm. I live on this beautiful farm. I've got cows all around me. And, um, and, and what does that allow us to do? Well, it allows us to settle, number one. So we start to develop a, a deeper relationship with you know, one kind of place in the earth. We start to develop a homeland, like the land of milk and honey. We start to develop a home. We start to develop a place in, in the cosmos, right? The other thing that came with that development is that once human beings weren't spending all of their energy sort of, uh, kind of getting where their next meal's going to come from, um, they, they could start to spend more time with each other, number one. So we start seeing the development of more like extended family units. We start seeing the development of, you know, back in the Paleolithic times, you know, a child like you know, was go going into puberty very, very early. And that child was having to, you know, be a part of hunting and be a part of conceiving children so that as soon as possible, so that the, that, so that there could be another one, you know, that comes. Once people settle down, there's a longer period of, uh, there's more abundance. So there's a longer period where you, you have more leisure, you have more time to connect with your family. There's, uh, you know, and then you start developing, you start developing civilization, which of course the goals, which we'll talk about what are the goals of civilization? What should we have as goals for our cultures and our societies? But those, those civilizations develop it, to make things easier for human beings so that they can start focusing on, you know, what we would call higher pursuits. And we're going to talk about Hathor as the mother of civilization 
and how what that means and why she's the mother of sacred relationships and why she's the mother of culture of music and dance and the arts and uh all of like the wonderful things that you know you know we have such a i think self-hating understanding of culture and society in this day and age because we've come through the dark ages right and society is very toxic right now. But there is this uh, beauty that comes through, and she's, and Hathor is also a goddess of beauty that comes through, you know, that leisure and that pleasure of sharing time and having more of that convenience to start focusing on, you know, beauty and to start focusing on intimacy and sacred relationship and start developing culture and start creating you know what makes life really worthwhile and then the you know what we're also going to find is that through Hathor came the the idea or the birth of the divine masculine really which is Ra, okay? So Hathor is the mother of Ra, the sun god. She's the consort of Ra, just like how we've got Mother Mary births Jesus, and then there's a Mary that's his consort. So again, the Magdalene lineage is a continuation of this spiritual line from Hathor to Isis to Mary Magdalene. So this is one lineage going back. But basically Ra, you know, on a metaphysical level, and we'll talk about this in the mystery school, you know, Ra represents the, the universal soul, like what we would call the Christ consciousness, or the realization of, you know, the Buddha nature, or the fact that there, there is something beyond this world, that it's not just nature, that it's not just you know the creation that it's not just the goddess and there's there is this cosmic level to our realization and and hathor hathor is like the you know a lot of times it's like are we gonna go the divine masculine path and worship the one god or are we gonna go like the divine feminine pagan worshiping fairies and, and angels and elements and and all the different gemstones and rocks and crystals you know like and it's just like people can't get like like the fact that these are one right that this is what that this is like you can worship both the one God and you and the all, like and the goddess and the mother. So that's why I say this is a tantric path because it, it's a path of union and really balancing that realization of the Christ, like through the mother, that realization of Ra, of like the, the, the golden oversoul, the cosmic oversoul the, the Christ did, you know, Krishna, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's usually in the mystery school traditions. It's just, it's described as divine masculine. Okay. It, but it is the union. So, and, and how we get there, how we get to that union is through Hathor, is through this, you know, this great mother goddess. Now I just ended up going off. I have like an actual PowerPoint to show you guys, but I totally didn't start with it. And it's probably gonna be a little um, of much of a mute point now that I've already gone through so much, but I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna pull it up anyways. So let me, um, let me figure out how to share my screen here. Uh, ra, 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 ra. Is Venus really Hathor? Um, well, Michelle, I would say that uh, Venus, like Hathor, is a form of Venus. So, to me, I think of Venus as sort of being like 
an overarching because it's a planet and like everybody all cultures are going to share venus in common whether you are like native american or whether you are indian or whether you are chinese or whether you are american whatever timeline you come in come from venus is always going to be there right in our solar system so there are a lot of manifest like i would say every culture has their manifestation of venus you know in in the egyptian culture it's hathor in the greco-roman culture it was aphrodite you know in the like the Indian, like Hindu culture, I, I, I feel like Parvati is probably the most similar to Hathor, but you might also say Lakshmi too, a little bit. Their cosmology is a little bit different. Um, I would say their cosmology is probably more sophisticated than all the other ones. So they have it kind of broken down into like even more like distinct areas but you know every culture tends to have like like whoever like the great mother goddesses of the culture and usually like a goddess of love and fertility and divine you know relationships and sacred sensuality you whoever that is in a given in a given culture would be like their form of venus so yeah um, I'm going to try to find how to, sh oh, here it is, sharing my screen. All right, here we go. All right, um, I'm going to do this. I'm going to share this. And uh, let's see, slideshow. Um, play from the start. Are you guys able to see this? If somebody, if you're seeing this, if it's transmitting, just say yes in the comments. Yes, okay, great, thank you. So um, let's dive in. I, I gave a little bit of an introduction and we'll just kind of go, go a little deeper here. Um, I'm calling this, uh, I called this uh, presentation out of Egypt mysteries of the cult of Hathor. And uh, I just I just want to explain this image a little bit. So this image is actually um, Moses, you know, parting, it's like the parting of the seas, right? So uh, there's a reason for that. Um, hold on, let me get to the, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna go here. There's a reason for this imagery because, um, if, if Hathor has come down to us in any sort of like story that you, that you having been born into a Judeo-Christian tradition are probably aware of, it's probably the Exodus story is like the main one where we hear about what is Hathor. And Hathor would be the, the golden calf from this Exodus story. So of course you have, um, you know, Moses, who was uh, a, Jew a Jewish, yeah, like a Jewish, I would even call Moses like an avatar, like a Jewish avatar that was born into the royal, well, he wasn't born into the royal family, he was adopted by the royal family of Egypt, and he learned and he studied all of the Egyptian magic and all of their traditions. And eventually, you know, his people were enslaved in Egypt during the end, the very end of the age of Taurus. So a lot of us consider Moses sort of the avatar that marked the transition from the age of Taurus to the age of Aries. And he, Moses himself is very Aries-like. He's, he's determined and he's assertive and he's bold and he's divine masculine and he gets angry a lot so we were moving from the age of taurus and we're going into the age of aries into the age of war into the age of conquest into the rise of the masculine god and monotheistic traditions might even say rise of the patriarchy so most of us are familiar with hawthor from this story because she is you know the what caused Moses to 
break the commandments. He's led the Jews out of slavery in Egypt. And he's, le he's leading them. This is what I find funny about the story. He's leading them to the promised land, which is like the land of milk. Of course, like when I connect to Hathor, like that's totally what her energy is. She's like milk and honey. She's like mama milk, like nurturing, loving energy. And she's like the sweetness of life. That is really what Hathor is about. That's what her energy field is like. So he's searching for Hathor. They're searching for a homeland, their place to build their civilization, which they didn't have. And, and even today, I mean, have just gotten a, a homeland, you know, during this, you know, last hundred years of time. So the Jews in general are, you know, I, I feel like they have sort of like this massive mother wound where they don't have Hathor, where they don't have like a sacred homeland. And I'm actually born, my mother is um, descended from the Kohanims who traced their lineage back to Aaron, the brother of Moses. So I was really born into like the culture that is kind of like in up in some ways in opposition to Hathor or doesn't get Hathor. So anyways, we have, um, you know, Moses comes down to the map from the mountains and he sees the people worshiping the golden calf. He goes into a rage. He breaks the commandments. He forbids them to ever worship this false idol. So most of us today, when we think of Hathor, we think of her as this false idol. We think of her as the the, the golden calf, there's like literally, and I don't know, maybe it's just me because I come from like a Moses lineage that it's like me trying to connect to Hathor was like disarming a bomb in myself. It was like, oh my God, if I connect to this energy, I am going to be a whore of Babylon. I am going to be an enslaver. I am going to be a wicked bitch an evil sorceress. It was like, I got to diffuse this fucking bomb inside me so that I can get back to like, you know, my, my milk and honey, you know, like where, where my like divine feminine sensuality is. And I think for a lot of us that have been raised in, you know, a culture that has been influenced by, you know, Judeo-Christianity and all of the wounds that have accumulated in you know, our collective consciousness and in our ancestral lines between where we are now and the age of Hathor, there is a lot that we've kind of got to break through. And I'm gonna get into that, uh, but that is why I, um, I chose this imagery of like, like bringing Hathor out of Egypt, liberating Hathor, okay? So we're gonna be liberating Hathor, liberating her from the stigmas, liberating her from kind of the, the same sort of, you know, enslavement that I feel like she's in right now in our global kind of collective consciousness. So um, let's just go. Uh, here are just a few of Hathor's titles, just so you guys know. Um, she's uh, one. Of, she's the, her main title is actually as a sky goddess. Okay, so she is the lady of the sky, the lady of the stars, lady of the sky. What this really represents is that she is the mother of the cosmos. That she, what? What do you think? The sky is holding everything, right? Uh, when you look at the sky, it's like everything is contained within the sky. So this really represents our understanding of the mother as, as being the creatrix, as being the universe itself, the Milky Way, you know? You could see the, the ancestors looking up at the Milky Way and it's, what does it look like? It looks like a giant, you know, white nurturing sort of like stream of milk flying through the sky that is our galaxy of which we are a part of. So we are, you know, being nurtured by this great mother of the universe. And um, 
I also find it interesting that Hathor is a, a sky goddess because she has like a Dakini nature and Dakinis are, they're more from the Tibetan and from the um, Buddhist cultures, but a Dakini is like, um, they're, they're called like the sky dancers and they're kind of like these like fierce primal little feminine, uh, they're like fierce primal spirits of the feminine. Um, and Dakini work tends to be more work that's based in sacred sexuality or that's based in tantric principles. So in some ways, you know, by, by us calling Hawthorne's main title the sky goddess, we're honoring that she is a Dakini as well, that she is a tantric goddess. Uh, Tantra is not a word that we use like in the Western canon and in the Egyptian canon, but she is that. She's that same consciousness like in the Western world. And I would certainly say that her priests and especially priestesses were definitely Dakinis or Tantrikas, what, whichever word you want to use. Um, the next sort of title that we have for Hathor is the Sacred Cow. I've sort of talked about that. That is kind of dropping more into her, you know, earth, earthly manifestation. Guys, this is a very, very grounded goddess. She is not out there, even though she is the cosmic. Uh, Hathor is down to earth. She is earthly. She's she's on. She's in the trenches with humanity, and she's helping to create, she's helping to build, she's helping to nurture civilization. She's the goddess of love, music, fertility, dance, sacred sexuality. That's sort of the Venus aspect. She was also a goddess of trade and travel and cattle and mining and gemstones. So this is something not a lot of people understand. And I think it's something that's that's I've really enjoyed bringing back out in my own work is understanding wealth and understanding economics and understanding trade and understanding business as a form of the of love as a form of the divine mother as a form of sacred relationships i've sort of devoted my life to developing and translating you know like tantric principles into business and into economic principles because if we don't do that as a civilization we're never going to be able to survive evolutionarily right now on this planet and goddess, I mean, goddess, and Hathor is a, a goddess of economics, really. She's a goddess of wealth. She's a goddess of gemstones and, and merchants and trading. And, you know, why would she be that? Well, because she is a goddess of you know, what starts to happen when you settle down and you're growing crops and you're taking care of, you know, you start building a culture, then you start having goods that you want to share, you know, with your neighbors. And, and that's a sacred relationship. And that brings more, you know, abundance, more, you know, milk and honey, more expansion of consciousness into your life. So, Something that I've really enjoyed is helping people see that that realm of business can be done on the principles of like divine feminine consciousness. It doesn't have to always be this heartless cutthroat, you know, Luciferian reality. Um, more on that, you'll have to sign up for the Sacred Wealth Call series. We're not going to go fully into it in this one, but I do teach on that just so you know. Um, she's a goddess of trees. Uh, this is because trees were very rare in Egypt. And if you can imagine, this is very hot culture. So the tree provides shade. Uh, it's kind of like a little oasis in, in many ways. And, the, and there's a few sacred trees to Hathor that are like very, it's, it's a tree that's very, very abundant in Egypt and it produces fruit like three or four times a year. So, and there's not that many trees. So they saw this tree as, you know, a form of nurturance, as a form of comfort, as a form of 
kind of like respite from the intensity of the elements. And so, you know, that's that nurturing side of Hathor that she gives us that ease and that grace. Um, I'm not going to go into all of these here. I do want to, you know, I've already talked about the mother of the Pharaoh and the consort of kings and this sort of results to Hathor's role in like, you know, that through the civilization, we can start to direct our consciousness to the, the more divine reality, you know, civilization in some ways gives us that ability to start to you know turn inward it gives us that ability to start to direct our energy towards you know more higher pursuits and um the you know the the manifestation of you know raw and we're going to get more into this is a form of that cosmic oversoul or that union or that realization of the divine father like in union with the mother principle it's also important to note that she is one of the main goddesses associated with, with the journey to the afterlife. So this was obviously a very big part of Egyptian culture. They're probably a, a culture that had some of the most, you know, you know, amazing rituals and writings about this afterlife journey. And um, is that somebody here? I heard a phone ringing. Anyways, um, let me try to mute your line if, if that, I don't know what that is. Um, the, the main thing I want to say about the afterlife is that to the Egyptians, you know, death was a journey into the underworld. And the underworld was very, very closely associated with the womb. So, you know, when you go into you know the sort of like the flip side of life you're you're journeying back into into the womb so it's a realm of the mother so she was a main goddess of like helping you with that journey and i think to this day you know whenever we're going through a death process or a challenge in our life or you know if you're familiar with doing a lot of the of the healing work that we really need to do to stay in alignment uh in you know our expression in the world in civilization we need to be able to journey within we need to be able to transmute shadows and just like just like you know, we throw things out onto the earth and she decomposes it and makes it into something rich and something fruitful that can give us new life. Hathor is the kind of the guide or the goddess of that underworld journey as well. Um, I've talked a little bit already about Hathor being an evolutionary goddess and some of what is all here. Uh, I think the main argument that, you know, I would want to make is that, you know, why is it important for us to connect to Hathor right now? And that is that if you're looking at where we are at as a, as a civilization, because we are now really turning into you know, I, you know, I say we as being like the Western civilization. So uh, I'm obviously American. I'm sure we have some people here who aren't, but America, Europe, um, Australia. But of course, like this, this Western consciousness has now, it's now kind of like trickling everywhere. It's like India is becoming Westernized. China is becoming Westernized. Uh, you know, we're losing a lot of indigenous cultures and we sort of have this like what I consider to be a very warped empire consciousness that's almost like operating like a tumor or a disease spreading all over the planet. 
and it's extremely toxic and it's going to uh, create, it's already creating some serious problems. We've got global warming, we've got lots of things coming up. But when you look at like the empire, like what this country, like why is this empire sick? Like why is this empire toxic that we have right now? Uh, it's toxic because there is no Hathor in it. <laughs> it's toxic because the consciousness of who Hathor is is not at all honored in the empire that has been built. You know, we've got, we've got marriages failing, family units breaking apart. We've got you know, some of the highest levels of even though we are as technologically connected as we possibly can be, there is loneliness, there is disconnection, we've got depression, mental illness, high, high instances of drug use, people do not know how to connect to simple sacred pleasure anymore, which is one of the things that, you know, Hawthor gives, you know, they've done studies of addiction, and really like if somebody gets connected to c the right community and they start receiving love and they start feeling like they have a purpose in society, the addiction falls away much more easily from, you know, really what Hathor represents. You know, we have a very stress-based civilization. We have a, a culture that is devoid I, in my opinion, of, of beauty and art, I mean, I, I drive around all the time and I'm just like, I mean, like, what's the point? Like, <laughs> like I'm like in, in Egypt, we, we designed for beauty our monuments and now it's just like plastered, you know, horrendous, ugly signs and billboards and and jarring flashing lights and noise pollution and there's no beauty there's no beauty in society you go into the art you go into the museum of modern art have you guys ever looked at modern art i'm just like what the f it's like dystopic like like white canvases with like a black slash or like i'm just like what is this it's just like the culture doesn't understand Hathor like at all like they just like it's just gone like they don't understand you know any of these things leisure I mean people in the west are working you know 12 hour days 14 hour days it doesn't matter if you're if you're poor you're you're doing it because you're working two to three jobs if you're rich you're doing it because you are a fucking addict and you're at you're on wall street all day 14 hours a day and it's just like no leisure no connection and of course when we're like this how are we gonna know to care for the earth how are we gonna know to care for people and plants and animals and ourselves if we don't have you know this isn't a, a, a cultural and a spiritual value of ours. And this is one of the reasons why I think it's so important to do this call on Hathor and like who she really is instead of this false sort of idea we have of, you know, the whore of Babylon. And, you know, that if I get involved with civilization, I'm going to get corrupted and, and all of that. We're going to go over that in this presentation today. So um, I want to talk a little bit here about, you know, why, like why we are afraid of the goddess. Why are we afraid of our bodies? Why are we afraid of, of you know, standing up and, and being uh, like a player in the world? Why are we afraid of building our own empires? Why are we afraid of making money? Why are we afraid of making impact? Why are we afraid of sharing our art, sharing culture? Why are we afraid of each other? Why are we insecure and isolated and alone? You know, why? Why? <laughs> why all these things? What's really going on? And I think like starting to understand a little bit about the history of the quote unquote empire can help us with that. So 
guys, I used to be a graphic designer before I did this. So I made this next, um, I made this next graphic myself. I'm very proud of it. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to go through some astrological history here. Um, and just so you know, uh, this is general timeline. So actual astrological ages are more like 2,150 years, some that. So in reality, like the age of Aquarius, I think is supposed to start in 400 years from now. But I think we're close enough to it that, you know, we're like the age of Aquarius is coming. So here is a timeline of the, the last ages of time. We are right here, okay? So we are moving from the age of Pisces. This was the age of Jesus. This was, we call this the dark ages. This was the time where everybody repressed themselves and went into penance. And uh, it was, you know, more of like the monk on the mountaintop time. And we're coming out of that into the age of Aquarius. Uh, this 10,000 years ago was the age of Leo. So this was sort of, I'm going to just get to the timeline that I want to be. This was our last golden age. What we're going to be focusing on is the age of Taurus, uh, the time of Hathor, the time of the great mother goddess. And I'm just going to go through a little bit of the timeline here so you can kind of orient yourself. Um, we've got, you know, the last golden age, the age of Leo, and the avatar of this time is, uh, is Rama, the Ramayana. This is, this is really a lost time, this and then going backwards. This was the peak of civilization. This was when like Atlantis and Lemuria and a lot of the, the lost cultures that were way, way more advanced than we are right now. There was, this was kind of like them. They like existed all back here and those cultures have been lost, but we do have, you know, epics. We do have epics about you know, we have legends about Atlantis and we have, you know, the, the Ramayana, which talks about like a whole world where people lived for thousands of years and there were magical creatures and beings on this planet. And you're just like, how could that have been this timeline? Everybody thinks, oh, it must have been, it's just a story. And I'm like, no, it wasn't a story. Uh, basically what happens is that a go in a golden age, it doesn't actually have to do with this mini cycle of these uh, signs. It has to do with where the planet is. So the whole, the whole sun is also rotating around the galactic center. And so when this, the whole sun and the whole solar system is very close to the galactic center, we are in what's called a golden age. And everything on earth really comes into alignment with like the divine, like with the, the divine plant, like, like everything is like much more magical. The avatar, which is basically Ra, like the, the Christed soul, when the Christ is born during this time, the Christ comes in as the king, okay? He literally, so Rama was the king during that time. So he comes in as the ruler. We have people with the highest consciousness are the leaders of the civilization. Uh, it's the time of divine monarchy. If you want to know more about this, I suggest you sign up for the Sacred Wealth Call series, and I'll give you some information on how you can do that at the end of this seminar. So this was this time, and if you know anything about the Ramayana, at the very end of this epic, Rama and Sita, Sita is it's kind of tragic. At the very end, Sita is consumed by the earth, and Rama ends up drowning himself. And so everything that happens with avatars 
is really representative of like the age and the time that they're in. And that was foreshadowing this next age, the age of cancer, which is when the great flood came. And so we lost these cultures and, and a, lot of, a lot of different civilizations talk and have myths about this time of global destruction where the age of Leo and the golden era was done. And this is the age of the floods. The avatar of this time is Noah. This is when Atlantis falls. And basically what happens is that we went back into a more primitive state. We were like cleansed out. We went back into a more primitive state. This timeline here, uh, we don't really have that much information from this time. Um, they would call this, you know, our history books would call this primitive man. What we do know is like civilization was beginning again. We had the Tower of Babel, the, the development of writing. And, and it eventually, you know, this was this time too, Gemini, the age of Gemini, it was very matriarchal because we returned to the earth. You know, we returned to the earth. We might have to do this again we might go through another mass global destruction in this timeline if we don't, you know, get it. You know, that's why I'm doing this seminar for you guys. So you go back to the mother, we go back to the mother here. And then the age of Taurus is really this time of like very great abundance. It's this time of plenty. Um, the avatar of this time is Krishna. And if you guys know about Krishna, uh, Krishna, you know, came and, and like made love to 108 gopis who were cow herding goddesses. And another name for Krishna is Gopala. And Gopala is, means like he who is the protector of cows. So, you know, this is really the age of Hathor. And it wasn't just Egypt that was worshiping a great you know, mother cow goddess. We are seeing all over the world in every different culture, this celebration of this like divine mother. It was an age of love, uh, sacred sexuality. I mean, Krishna is like one of the only avatars that like gets to get it on, you know? Like he's making, he like creates himself into 108 men so he can make love to all the gopis at once. And it was said that like when when Rama came, like he was so attractive and like all these divine beings and all these like sacred deities, all these like inner plane goddesses like loved Rama so much, but he was so devoted to Sita. He was so only for Sita that he promised them that he would come back. And when he came back, he would come back as this great lover and he would make love to, you know, everybody. And so this is really the age of Taurus. And this is, this is like, I feel like the Hawthorne Mystery School is very much a representation of like this divine beloved, this divine Christ being that is making love to everybody. And we are in this period of abundance and we are in this period of overflow and we're building pyramids and, and life is good. Life is good. We're going to talk about the shadow though of the age of Taurus, because what they say is that with every astrological age, the opposite. So whatever is opposite the Zodiac, which opposite of Taurus is Scorpio. And the, there is an influence of the opposite, like during that timeline. So there is a shadow to the age of Taurus and there is a shadow to what took place in the temples of Hathor, which really relates more to the Scorpio energies of Let's think of what Scorpio is. It's kind of like secrecy and black magic and the occult and seduction and jealousy and adultery and and like this, you know, stingy, like cold, self-destructive type of energy. 
And so I would even say like BDSM and um, like slavery, right? So we had slavery going on during this time and that was not good. And so a lot of these like sort of the shadow of the age of Taurus was, you know, basically what happened is that we entered during the age of Taurus, it was like great abundance, wonderfulness, yay, yay, yay. And then we enter what's called the Kali Yuga, okay? This is, so now you think about the whole solar system was very close to the sun, basically here, okay, during this timeline. Then we fell, we start moving away from the galactic center. We're moving away, we're moving away, we're moving away, we're moving away, okay. In the middle of the age of Taurus, we hit what's called the Kali Yuga. And this is where the shadow comes in. And we're gonna now start moving to an age of darkness, okay? And this Kali Yuga lasts from the age of Taurus, through the age of Aries, through the age of Pisces, which is the absolute darkest of all, well, actually, you might say that right around here when Jesus came was like the absolute darkest time. And that's why when you hear about Jesus, like if you read about Jesus, who was the avatar of between Aries and Pisces, you know, Jesus would say things like, you people, like this is, what age am I in? Like you people are so ignorant. Like you people, like it's just such a dark age. Like. Think about it. In, in the golden age, if Jesus came, he would be the king. We would have all loved him. He would have been our ruler. In this age, he's literally got a crown of thorns and we're all attacking him and putting him on a cross. So this is the very heart of darkness right here. And basically, what happened during the age of Taurus or during the time of Hathor is that the shadow that started, the shadow that started this fall from grace really started here. And I call that shadow the mother wound, <laughs> okay? And we're really gonna get into that. We really go into that in the Out of Egypt course and into healing that because basically, you know, we, we have this wonderful culture, but it was almost like we were like little children and, and we got, we got like too consumed with all of it. And I might not have time to go into all levels of the shadow of what took place in the cult of Hathor. Um, we will be going into all of it in depth in the out of Egypt course that we'll be launching at the end of this call. But basically I found that all of us sort of have on a soul level, like in our typical drama and our typical event, something that happened during this timeline that we find very hard to forgive ourselves for. And it's sort of like brought us like into the darkness. So then you had, you know, the age of Aries and Moses, and Moses is trying to now liberate people from, you know, the shadow of what was built during, you know, the Hathor times and, you know, obviously slavery and trying to liberate from the excesses and the addiction. Addiction is a shadow of Scorpio. And so he's now bringing in, like, he's got 10 commandments, like, you're going to follow these. If you don't, I'm going to break them over your neck. Like, you're going to worship the one God. He's trying to get pe people back in line. So we have this age of Aries, we have the Roman Empire, lots of war and conquest going on. And then basically Jesus comes and we all just decide we're good for nothing and we're just gonna like fucking punish ourselves now. Like self-flagellation, renounce everything, renounce the material world, renounce sex, renounce the, you know, renounce money, renounce everything you know, go, go hide. I mean, most of the age of Aries culture kind of came to a halt. And so everything from, 
you know, the, the Hawthorne mystery schools during this timeline, everything went underground. So, you know, Magdalene underground, secret societies underground, you know, the Cathars and the Knights of Templar and anybody that was holding basically the old mysteries of like, the, of like this timeline had to be in secret because the Catholic church was just fucking taken off heads and burning people. And it was like, you are not allowed. Like civilization is not allowed to exist. And basically, you know, we are doing this because the planet is going, is, is moving away from the light. And I think once you can really kind of like break the identification with all of this and just realize that, okay, people were moving into a new time now. Like we're moving out of this age of Pisces. We're moving into this new age, which is out of the Kali Yuga. The Kali Yuga is ending right here, right at this time that we're in now. Kali Yuga, well, some people say it ends in 400 years, but basically it's ending. We're coming out of it. We're coming out of this traumatic time. And the Aquarian age, and this is why they call us New Agers, because we're kind of the ones who are here like, everybody get out, like, get out of Pisces. Like, it's a new time. We got shit to do. You know, so the age of Quar Aquarius is, is this, is this gold? It's really, a, it's, it's a golden age. It's, it's, where is it across from? Aquarius is right across from this age of Leo. And in some ways it might even be better than the age of Leo because in Leo, it was good, but everything is going to get bad by the end of that story, right? Right now, everything is bad, but we got nowhere to go but up. We've got nowhere to go but into more goodness. Now, Aquarius is also kind of like, you know, the exact opposite of Leo. Leo's like we're all sort of worshiping like the, the king. And in the Aquarian age, what we're really going to realize is that we're all the king. Like we're all the queen. It's the age of humanitarianism. It's, it's an air sign. So it's the age of communications. We've got, you know, all this increase in technology going on. It's going to be this age of humanitarian service. It's this age of like realizing that God is actually everyone, that we're all the manifestation of Rama, Krishna, Jesus, that we're all the manifestation of this one, you know, oversoul. And the real, real, what I say is like the real, real calling of this time that we're in, like, how do we activate this like new civilization that is going to be, you know, conscious and egalitarian and loving and giving and we're going to be opening like new realms of technology and we're going to be opening up you know we're going to move back we've got two things here number one we have got to heal the mother wound ain't nobody going to be getting into the aquarian timeline if we don't heal what started here right? That's what we're seeing right now, the massive mother wound with the earth, the massive mother wound with our bodies and with sex and with money. And it's like we can't control ourselves, right? Because we've forgotten what sacred pleasure really is. We've forgotten what sacred nurturance really is. We've forgotten what the mother really is. And I'm going to talk more with you guys about all of that this is why I'm very passionate about healing our relationship to Hawthorne. You also notice that Taurus and Scorpio are sort of like right on the cross current here. So it's kind of like, you know, what do we need in order to bring about this like divine kind of union with the golden age? Because remember, Aquarius is going to be impacted by everything that is going on in Leo, the age of the divine king, right? And, and this is what I tell people like when I'm coaching, 
people like in business and stuff, yes, even though it's the Aquarian age, even though like we're not going to have like, you're on top and I'm below and you're better and God is up here and I'm down here and we're all going to be realizing ourselves as God we still need to realize we are kings and queens and gods, you know? And, and so that's where, you know, when I'm trying to help people in business, I'm like, you got to get into your power. You've got to get into your sovereignty. You've got to get into your royalty. But then it's not like you're royal and nobody else is. It's like, you're royal and everybody else is royal, including the ant, including the tree over there, right? That's what we're really going for. And that's really like the consciousness that's going to heal the world. And it's this consciousness, okay, you could think about it in business, but also think about it in how we relate to each other. Think about it in terms of sacred sexuality and intimacy. You know, how many of our relationships are still based in this, like, these, like, warped power dynamics where it's like, like, I can't express my needs because if I say those needs, you're not going to love me or you're going to say no because you need this because you're on top and I'm on bottom and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, uh-uh, people, we need new sacred relational templates because in this age, everybody's a king everybody's a queen, everybody's sovereign, and we need to know how to relate from that place. And there's a lot of deprogramming that needs to happen. And, and also the clearing of these wounds that happened here. So liberating Hathor, um, out of Egypt and into service in our present time. Um, I'm going to talk about the Venus path. Uh, again, I told you that the Hawthorne Mystery School is a Venus Mystery School. And this is a, a tantric and a devotional spiritual path. I would say that it's really kind of like a mixture of like Tantra. If you're familiar with like the Eastern spiritual paths, it's a mixture between like Tantra, uh, which is like a path of of really, it's like uni unifying opposites, okay? So non-dualism and unifying opposites, and it's sort of based in this divine masculine, divine feminine thing, and, and Tantra has a more, you know, expressive component to it than, than repressive. So you, you let yourself work things out. Sometimes you'll maybe challenge yourself to like go step into an archetype or something you're afraid of to kind of go experience it. So you realize, oh, there's part of me that that's too, and then you bring that into union. So it's tantric, it's, it's devotional, so it's a path of love. Um, it's, it's, it's based in divine love and God and Hathor is a goddess of love and, and divine love for the beloved, the beloved being Ra, the beloved being what we would call the Christ or the true self of all. It's, uh, based in, uh, I would also say there's a little Raja yoga, which Raja yoga is the path of the queen or the king. Okay. So it's also, you know, tantric, bhakti, and royal. Like that's like the three energies that are really in the Venus mystery school. And what I want to say about Venus is that Venus is a path that honors the body. It honors materialism. It honors the creation. It honors divine sensuality, right? Because you know, this is the feminine, the body is feminine, the senses are feminine, the ego is feminine, your ego is, is the divine, is Shakti, really, your ego, your individual self is Shakti. Now, in our, a lot of our spiritual traditions, we're taught that the ego is bad, and the ego is wrong, and we have to try to efface the ego and not have an ego. But in the Venus path, that's not what we do. Instead, what we do is this is where the sacred prostitute comes in, the, the Hathor, the divine mother, who's the ultimate lover, the ultimate devotee, the ultimate prostrator. She prostrates to 
raw. She prostrates to the king. She prostrates to the Christ or the divine self or the soul. So we don't try to get rid of our egos. We don't try to get rid of our human life. We don't try to overcome, like transcend our body and not, and, and not enjoy life. What we do is we devote that to the Christ, to the true self within us. And, and, you know, sometimes we experience the Christ in a form outside of ourselves, but ultimately we understand that we're all that. And so the Venus path is not about getting rid of the ego or shaming the body or demonizing any of this, but it's about prostrating that before the infinite, devoting, not prostrating, devoting, devoting, being passionate about bringing your ego into alignment with your soul. It's, it's like bringing your life, bringing your work, bringing your body, bringing your health, bringing, bringing everything about you into alignment with the divine. So that's like how this works. And the mother shows us, the mother shows us how she leads us to the divine. So we don't, you know, desire leads us to God. You know, the Shakti, the, the, the callings, the, the sensual, like what, what we really want. We, we follow that. We follow Hathor. We follow the pleasure. We follow the sensuality and we find the divine. We find Ra through it. Okay. So it is tantric. It is a love path. It's devotional. It's, it's based in love. And, and Venus, you know, they say Venus is one of the hardest spiritual paths because in order to realize Venus, you really have to bring every level of your life into alignment. So Venus is not going to say like, okay, go here on the mountains and repeat the japa and you don't need to worry about anything else. You just repeat the japa and we do the, you know, that's not Venus. Venus is like, no, you have to take responsibility for all of it. You have to bring all of it to the king. You have to bring making your bed in the morning to the Christ. You have to bring, you know, your career, the way you make money. You have to bring your body, you know, what you eat and how you take care of yourself. You have to bring how you relate when you pick up the phone. How are you, how are you loving that person? Everything. You bring everything to God. That's what the Venus path is like. And also on the Venus path, you know, Venus is considered the mother of, of demons. <laughs> She's considered the guru to the Asuras or to the demonic realms. And basically what that means is when you're working with Venus energies, so you're working with materialism, you're working with drives and instincts and sex and money and and making your bed in the morning and all you're working with life here like everything about it you're working with that shit so you have to become the guru it's not like you become the guru to all you have to become the guru to your own demons that's what that means you have to become responsible for your shadows on the Venus path. You can't just kind of let that shit slide. So, you know, it's, it's an edgier path in some ways because we're allowing ourselves to really be who we really are. And we're also, you know, going into, you know, the parts of ourselves that are wounded and we're saying, uh-uh, you don't get to be like this anymore, honey child. Like, you got to get up. And we're, we're picking up and, we're, and we're, we're becoming responsible for our own shadows and we're bringing them into alignment with the divine. Um, <clears throat> just, let me just go to the next slide. I don't know what's one of the hardest paths to master. I think I talked about all of this. So I'm going to just go to the next slide. I think I've talked about all of this. Um, so here's what I want to talk about, because I want to talk about some of the challenges that come up on the Venus path. 
and and some of the like why horror about like why this like scary sort of like horror of Babylon, Babylon. Why are we afraid? Why are we afraid of sex? Like, why are we afraid of becoming rich and powerful? Like, why are we afraid? Why are we afraid of becoming kings and queens? Why do we stop ourselves? Why do we stop ourselves from being the, the, the king or the queen of creation? Why? Why do we hold ourselves back? Have you ever wondered about that? Mm -hmm. Well, um, a lot of times we stop ourselves because we don't really trust ourselves. We don't really know ourselves. That's why you have to be in worship of the Christ or you have to be in worship. I, I use that word Christ. You could use the beloved. You could use the true self, the soul. You have, this is a path of really coming to know who you really are and to know that who you are is good that who you are is God, that who you are is love itself, and coming to really trust that about yourself. And the reason why people stop themselves from shining and the reason why people stop themselves from, you know, let, letting themselves have everything in life and, and really going for who they really are is because they're afraid. They're afraid of themselves really on some level and this sort of goes into like the three levels of the mother because because i understand that in this mystery school like you are hathor like you are shakti you are the mother the ego is her it is sophia it is the the kind of like the enslaved feminine principle this kind of gets into some of the deeper teachings of the mystery school but basically the feminine the the feminine principle is the universe itself but she's forgotten that she's god okay she forgets who she is and she gets identified with you know all these things that that make her feel separate from her beloved, right? And so there are three kind of levels of consciousness through which we, ex we experience ourselves and through which Hathor or the mother or the goddess experiences herself as well. Um, the first one, I'm just gonna move this here for a second. The first one is Maya. Okay, and Maya is the illusion. She is the temptress, she is the whore, and she is the enslaver, okay? She is the unconscious state of the universe itself when it does not know it's God and it is just operating. And you guys, like, mama is powerful. And if you guys don't know this about mama yet, there are levels of mama that are fucking terrifying. There are things in the universe that go on that are fucking terrifying. And um, in mama, you know, there is, there, there could be some really fucking traumatic shit going down. In mama is contained evil, not in God, but in mama. Of course, it's an illusion. The evil is a shadow. It's an illusion. It's not real in the same sense that the ultimate is real. But if you don't know you, if you don't know God, then you can come up against some things in the creation that can be very, very difficult to deal with until you know. So this is one level of how you can experience the mother. You can experience her as vicious and terrifying, the great temptress, the whore of illusion. You can experience her as like the root of all evil itself, right? Sex, the root of all evil. Money, the root of all evil. Anybody that's saying that, you got to know where they're at with how they see themselves and how they see the goddess. This is where they're at, okay? So Maya can only enslave us if we do not know Christ, if we do not know Ra, if we do not know who we really are. 
if we're afraid of Maya, if we're afraid of sex, if we're afraid of money, if we're afraid of being too big, if we're afraid of building an empire, it's because we do not trust ourselves with money, with power, with sex or desire, right? We don't trust ourselves. We don't know ourselves. We're afraid. And it means that a part of us is, is in there and it's programmed probably with some trauma. Maybe it happened in your lineage. Maybe it happened at this life back here. Maybe it happened in your childhood, but it's programmed with some shadow that is making you like not like unenlightened in that area. And so then Maya or mama in her shadow form is possessing you. Now, um, the second aspect of the mother is this aspect. I call it, you know, Shakti. In the Egyptian tradition, we called it the Ka. It's the spiritual life force. In the Christian tradition, it's called the Holy Spirit. And it's basically divine creative power. So you, you can then move out of Maya, you can then move out of Maya, and now you are experiencing the mother as basically energy. It's like, oh, okay, uh, the, the universe is an energy. My body is an energy. And so when we start experiencing the mother as Shakti, uh, we start, this is the path of like, you know, yoga and breath work and qigong, we start sort of like developing our energy fields and we start uh, working with power and manifestation and we start cultivating our life force, we start eating healthily in our bodies and, and working with the mother as Shakti, instead of seeing the mother as illusion, whore, temptress, evil realm, oh my God, horrible. If you see it as that, you're going to be stuck in that area. So the next place to go is instead you think of money as life force. Don't think of it as the root of all evil. Think of it as, you know, fuel that's going to help you manifest something in alignment with Ra, <laughs> in alignment with your divine heart and soul, right? So you, 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 you don't think of sex as evil and horrible, but you, but you start really considering it as a form of energy cultivation, as a form, you know, this is when in Tantra, you know, the men start learning how to like control their ejaculations and the women start doing breast massage. They start feeling their body. They start feeling the energy in it. And they're like, this isn't evil. This isn't wrong. They're like, it's an energy. It's a sacred energy. And so then you can, you know, it's very important to have a Shakti practice in your life in order to not drop into Maya. Okay. In order to not drop into the illusion. If you're not practicing Shakti, if you're not eating well, if you're not meditating, if you're not doing your breath work, if you're not doing your sacred sensual body practices, if you're, if you're not devoted to Shakti in this way, it's going to be very easy for everything to become Maya, for you to become enslaved, for everything to become hard, for you to get stuck in the shadow, okay? Um, and then if you want to go even higher than Shakti, the highest way to think about, you know, the mother or the creation is to think about her as mama, as mother. Uh, you know, what is the mother? The mother is like the most nourishing. I mean, all of us primarily are programmed with like this intense yes to mother consciousness when we're in the womb when we're being held when we're being nurtured we feel so safe we feel so loved the source of unconditional love the source of like divine love well imagine if you started thinking of money as this the mother well imagine if you started thinking of money in ways where every way you're working with money is is through this consciousness of love and care and nurturing of yourself and others. This is where I got it. I'm like, I got to get the whole planet onto this frequency. But because I'm just like, 
get out of my, uh, like, like if you were working with money from the mother consciousness, things would be very different right we would we like i remember where i would i used to work at amazon and i was talking to my friend who was like a, a consultant she's like this powerful sort of like woman of business and i started talking to her because i was working at amazon and i was talking about how they didn't have these environmental practices and i and and you know they were sending people home because of these toxic chemicals and the and the punching of the clocks and how miserable it was. And I was just like, wouldn't it be amazing if like they had like health assurance plans for their employees where we all had, you know, a form of, you know, like, like money that we could invest in like natural health and natural healing and, and, and keep ourselves really happy. And if we integrated this into the work environment, everybody would be so much more pleased and like, Da, 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 da. And I'm like, and I'm thinking to myself, what's the point of even having a corporation if it's not to create family, if it's not to create love and nurturance for the people that work there, for everybody that you're serving with your gifts? And my friend just laughed and laughed and laughed. And she's like, you know nothing about business. And I want, and, 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 and it was just like, you know, it is true. That is how the business world tends to work, but it's not how it should work. And it's not how Hawthorne would have trade work. Okay. So the highest expression, I might have to move inside because my computer's about to die and I know I, I tend to go so over. But anyways, the highest expression, imagine if you thought of sex through the mother consciousness. If you, saw an, uh, if you saw a topless woman and instead of seeing her breasts and going into like lust and objectification, you thought about how those nurture children. You know, if we had the mother consciousness integrated in, in terms of sexuality, women's relationship to their bodies would totally change. Men's relationship to women would totally change. And women's relationship to men would totally change. So this is the Venus path. We're like working our way out of Maya and we're, and we're you know, we're going to be based, we have very strong Shakti practice. I'm going to have to go inside or this thing's going to die. So Hopefully this will stay. We have a very strong Shakti practice and, um, and we're working towards seeing creation and we're working towards seeing, you know, our relationships, our body, ourselves, our entire life. We're working at seeing that as, um, as of all of it, as a form of the Divine Mother. And of course, like being in service, let me just plug this in, to our divine self, to Ra, to the Christ. And this is basically an introduction. This is just a very basic introduction to the mystery school and to Hathor. And um, now that I'm inside, let me catch my breath here for a little bit. Um, It feels really good. It feels really good to have like shared this. I just want you guys to know that I have had to come out of hell literally to bring these teachings and all of this back through. And it is, you know, I won't go into my personal story here, but um, in many ways, you know, I, I, I feel myself as hot, like in many ways, it's almost like Hathor has lived through me and I've kind of lived through all of her wounds and all of the things that have been cast upon her. And um, it just feels really good. I just want to take a moment to honor that. And I know we've got some raised hands. I, I will take some questions. But before I get there, what I want to what I want to let you know is that if you guys are interested in going deeper, if you guys are interested particularly in being initiated as 
it's a author priest or author priest. Um, I'm launching something for the first time, which is basically I want to gather those who are this on a soul level. I feel as if there are many of us where we were this. We were this in our past lives. You've, you've already been initiated in other lifetimes. And you are here. And you are here to you know, help others, to practice this yourself, and then also to really be an agent, to be somebody who is, who is now helping other people in this world come out of, you know, horror, Babylon, Maya, all of this, and really getting them, you know, into the sacred expression of the mother consciousness. You might be a health coach. I mean, there, there are many levels you can do this on. You can do this through working with people on their bodies. You could do this through working with sexuality and relationships. You can do this through being a healer or an energy worker. You can do this through, um, you know, being a business coach, working with people with wealth and with money and all these things. But I know that like anybody who's attracted to me and anybody who follows me is basically you're part of this soul tribe where we're like here trying. We're like trying to get people to get into this Aquarian age and to heal this mother wound, which manifests in all of these different ways. And my calling has been like the, 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 the Hathor like tribe of healers or like teachers or, you know, really like, let me just be real. I want it. I would call you guys sacred prostitutes, but there's such a stigma associated with that word. It's like reinitiate the prostitutes, Kara, like reinitiate the prostitutes. And I'm just like, yes, this is exactly what needs to happen. I don't, you know, we do use that word in this program, but it does not necessarily mean you are a sex worker. In fact, I'm very, very, I, I don't, I'm not opposed to sex work or people that are working, like sharing their body to help others heal. It's just, you have to be really, really careful because the paradigm that is around that and that's something that will go in and, and out of Egypt and in the initiations. The paradigm that's around that tends to be so based in Maya. It tends to be so based in something that is going to be like hurting you on some level. And I understand that I'm friends with a lot of tantricas and strippers and escorts who they're not in that paradigm. They're doing it on, you know, where they're in the power seat and they're being more of like a guide and a healer and a teacher. So I'm not opposed to it, but I want you to know that when I use that word, it doesn't necessarily, that's not what I mean. I'm meaning that you are going to be a devotee of the mother. You're going to be a devotee of this consciousness. You want to be initiated in this mystery school tradition you and have these initiations to both support you in your life and to also be able to carry them out to others in your work. So um, if you guys, I'm going to just, let me do this right now. Um, I'm going to, you can go to, you go to wakingbeauty.com uh, forward slash ascension, A, S-C-E-N-S-I-O-N. I'm going to figure out how to put this thing back. Okay, there we go. On me. Um, I'm, got, we're, I'm, I'm launching an initiation. We're going to start on the summer solstice, and it goes until the fall equinox. And let me tell you, there's two initiations that are coming out. So I'm going to tell you about the differences between them. The first is out of Egypt, the ascension of the sacred prostitute path. And what this three month initiation is, is it is a deep immersion into this Venus mystery school. It is going to be a full transmission of 
you know, Hathor, a full transmission of like the spiritual principles and powers and the way the mystery traditions worked. Um, it's going to be a full activation and initiation for you to like carry the flame, right? To carry this medicine forward and to also get like connected to the, the divine lineage behind it. So you are going to be activated. You're going to be activated in this path. So it's going to be a three month program and we have a live event and that live event will be in San Diego, California. Uh, it's going to be called return of the temple. It is a pink Tantra event. So it's not, you know, it's not going to be sex based. It's not going to be nudity based, but we are going to be working with tantric principles. There may be exercises which involve somatics, which involve body movement, which involve you working with a partner, you sharing emotions, possibly even some forms of clothed touch. But it's not like a full blown red Tantra event. It's really, we're doing this on the Lion's Gate 8 8 2019, which is when the. Um, when Sirius, which is basically like the star that overlighted, the star seed nation that overlights ancient Egypt, it's basically when the earth comes into alignment with Sirius, like Sirius rises on the horizon on 8-8. And to the ancient Egyptians, this, si this signaled uh, the, the flooding of the Nile happened this time. So you can imagine like the really hot summer ended and now you have the, the abundance that comes. Like their summers are like what our winters are. And it's also the beginning of their new year. And so I feel like at this event and those who are being initiated are going to, we're really going to be calling in the ancient power. We're going to be calling in the the power of Hathor, the power of this divine mother. And out of Egypt is focused more in the realm of sacred relationships and sacred sexuality, okay? So it's more about activating in the realm of the divine mother and the divine lover and sacred, the basics of sacred relationships, the basics of developing like a Shakti practice for yourself as like a priest or a priestess of Hathor, as a sacred prostitute, the basics of all of the mysteries of Hathor, we go much deeper into Hathor, and like the basic teachings of the mystery school which you are also being blessed to like carry forward to others because that's like the main thing is that like i want to be able to have people you know bring this out like it could be something that you integrate into your own work whatever that is so that is out of egypt forward slash ascension uh, that program is going to go from the summer solstice to the fall equinox. It's three months. It's going to be a summer program, and we have an, a live event in August in San Diego on the Lion's Gate where everybody is going to come together. Now, you can do the course without the live event, but in order for you to be fully initiated to like carry the teachings forward, I'm asking you to come to the live event because there is going to be an actual activation that occurs there because I want to know you, I want to support you, I want to make sure that you get the full, you know, embodiment behind these teachings and I know that like some of that can't guys, this is a this is a school of like divine materialism. Like we need to be in person. <laughs> We need to be able to touch and see and connect with one another. And we kind of have to have that for you to be fully initiated. So you can go through the program on its own, but in order to uh, be black, like have my blessing to bring these mysteries forward for others, you have to come to the live event. So, and there's two prices. So if you just do the online 
training, it's going to be 997. And then if you come to the live event, it's one, it's 1997. So it's like 2000 dollars. Now, after um, the initiation out of Egypt, we will be starting the Sacred Wealth Academy in the fall. And right now, if you're interested and you want to go deeper on the application of this mystery school tradition to uh, specifically business and specifically economics, I'm doing a call series. It's not free, but it's on a, a donation basis. It's uh, wakingbeauty.com forward slash SW, like sacred wealth dash initiation. Sign up for that. We're going to be doing that in June. And then the Sacred Wealth Academy will start on the fall equinox. And that's, that's a longer program. And in that program, what we really work on is money, wealth, business, and helping you run your own empire based on these principles. So those of you who do uh, out of Egypt, if you want to get blessed as sort of like a, as a carrier of this flame, as a carrier of this message, as, as a priest or priestess of Hathor, and you don't have to call yourself that, you will get like a certificate at the end. You will be like, a, like sanctified. You will also get the energetic alignment with the lineage behind this. So if you do that and then you want to go to the Sacred Wealth Academy when that opens in the fall, you can apply uh, 997. You can basically apply $1,000 from what you spent doing out of Egypt. You can apply that to the tuition for the Sacred Wealth Academy. Okay, and the Sacred Wealth Academy tuition is longer because, I mean, higher because it's a, a longer program. And the doors to that aren't open yet. We're doing the call series now. But again, that is going to be specifically around like building the empire, like building your business, um, having success, developing a sacred relationship to money, sort of moving out of that money is the root of all evil and moving up, moving up the ladder into getting you to actually experience abundance as sacred, allowing that into your life and, and supporting you to build a really rich business around that, around your gifts. So um, again, the two, the two URLs, the first one out of Egypt is Waking Beauty W A K I N G B E A U T Y dot com forward slash ascension A S C E N S I O N. And because we've got a whole other call series for the Sacred Wealth Initiation, I'm just going to let you guys, if you want more information on that, sign up for the next call series. It's, even the call series itself is extremely worthwhile. If you can't tell from like this free call that I did today, I give a lot of information at, on my seminars that is very, very valuable. So um, that's got three seminars in it. So it's going to be really, really cool. And for those of you who did Sacred Wealth Academy last year, like it's on a totally different level now. It's like badass. So there's a lot in there. So I highly encourage you guys to sign up if you want to know more about the empire building. What I want to focus on right now is out of Egypt, the ascension of the sacred prostitute path, what we're going to do over these next three months. Um, this, there's, you know, it's very similar to what we did on the call today. Number one, we're going deep into Hathor herself. We're going to be getting up close and personal with this goddess. We're going to be doing ritual work and ceremony with her. You're going to be developing a personal relationship to this deity, and you're really going to be learning about her. You're going to be learning about all of her different roles, all of her different titles. And what's more important than, you know, knowing is actually like the gnosis, the inner connection that you have. So in a lot of my courses, there are energy transmissions and healing activations and guided kind of shamanic journeys that we take to 
find this within ourselves so that she guides us. You're also going to be being initiated into the Venus Mystery School. So you're going to be learning about, you know, all the different components and how to really like walk the path of this sacred prostitute in today's time, but in a way that is like 100% going to be working for you on every level and working for like the divine on every level. It's like, walking into a state of grace and um you know mystery school traditions i just want to be clear so it's like yes there's practical information but a lot of the initiation into the mystery is it's like giving you seeds that like open they open over time so the it becomes something that enfolds within you this is like a, a divine activation it's 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 an initiation like you would if you were studying with you know a, sh a certain shamanic path or you're studying a certain cultural tradition and then it becomes a part of your life you get attunement to the guides you, you it, it changes you on a soul level right and it starts to guide you through life from this new way of being um so you're going to have full initiation into the mystery school. We're also going to be really focused on two other things in this program. The first thing are the practices of divine love, sacred relationship, and erotic sovereignty. So it's really about like healing your lover nature and awakening eros, erotic eros, which is romantic divine love. And, and from that becomes how we basically treat everyone. You know, it's, it's learning how to be a lover in the way that you walk through this world. And let me tell you, like, this isn't like some fluff, okay? Like, this isn't some fluff that you're going to be getting in this course. Because we're going to be learning, like, as if we are sacred prostitutes. And one of the things that I want to say about going back to, like, the three levels of Maya and, like, Maya and Shakti and Mother is, like, okay, so you see yourself, right? You see yourself in a certain way or you see money in a certain way or you see your body in a certain way and if you're seeing your body from the perspective of maya it's going to become a shadow realm it's going to become the enslaver the temptress the horrible kind of like struggle you're having with emotional eating or like body dysmorphia or whatever it is because you're still seeing through maya there right okay here's the key who you are relating to so if you are somebody that maybe you don't see the world through Maya, but you are relating to somebody who is seeing you through Maya, right? You are relating, you are in relationship to somebody who is seeing through the shadow, okay? Because they're not at a high, high enough frequency or high enough vibration of consciousness. So, in the Christian path, you know, you would, you would show up with that person in this like loving, self-sacrificial lamb type of way and get really fucking taken advantage of. Now, if you're learning how to be a real sacred prostitute, you have to know like who you're relating to. You have to know how to understand what level of consciousness that they're on. And if you are relating to somebody that is going to see you through Maya, you have to become Maya to that person. You have to become dominant. You have to become sometimes a bitch. You have to become, you know, you have to become savvy. You have to become like all of, we don't throw out and say like, oh, the goddess is only the mother and she's not this. No, the goddess is all of this. And, you know, one of the things that I've seen a lot for, you know, women or women getting abused or women getting taken advantage of is they get into a relationship with somebody who is, you know, what I call like a dark lady or a dark lord. And they're 
operating through Maya and you're coming into the relationship from your like holy mother consciousness and you are going to get massively you know abused in that process so we have to learn we have to learn how to alternate between all the different archetypes all the different energies this is about becoming a master of relationship it's about becoming fearless on the path of love and when we and when we operate you know if we have to go into like the supreme court maybe we need to go in there as like one of Hathor's Maya forms is Sekhmet, the bloodthirsty lioness. You know, we have to be able to use that sometimes when we're relating to something in the creation that is on that level. And these are all what we would call like sacred prostitute skills because the sacred prostitute, she knows how to like bring in different archetypes, bring in different powers, or he knows how to relate you know, she's, this is the tantric, this is the tantrika, and they know how to relate, they're relationship savvy. So we're going into like, how do you become a master of relationship? Because if you are the master of love, and you can hold love in a primally effective way through how you relate to everybody, no matter what, you become the Raja, you become the king or the queen of creation, right? And you're not a tyrant in that state. It's just that you can work with the energies. And in order to do that, we have to clear our traumas that we have around what I call like the temple wounds. Because if you are still afraid of like working with this archetype or you're still afraid of working with the Maya energy, if you need to, because you don't want to be seen as a bitch or you don't want to be seen as a whore or you don't, all these things. So the, the fourth component of what we go through in the mystery school are clearing the, the traditional karmic wounds that are associated with you know, being a priest or a priestess of, of basically a goddess temple in the ancient world. And for those of you who, who've worked with me before, you're familiar with the Magdalene wounds. These are all going to be different than the Magdalene wounds. These are very, very specific to temples, to like you you you're you're getting attuned to a temple lineage. And so you need to be aware and you need to have cleared from your field all the fears that would stop you from owning this in this life. So they're very, very specific. And um, I'm really excited because I've been developing all of this work for many, many years, holding some of these pieces like this, like a kid on Christmas. I can't wait to bring this out. And I'm offering that to um, all of you guys uh, today, now, in this timeline, and it's really, really exciting for me. Um, so Lacey asked, is the course once a week? Can you speak more to the format? Yes. So the course is going to have uh, weekly videos that come out. This has been a request that people have made for me because you can see my seminars are quite long. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be breaking up the teachings into like weekly videos that come with an exercise, okay, that come with, you know, you know, rituals to do, things to integrate during that week. And um, you're going to be kind of guided through the process, through the videos and the PDFs and the guides that go along with them. And then there um, may even be like homework assignments because this is something where you're getting an initiation. So I may actually ask you guys to do things that you have accountability for. So this week you get this video, and you get this teaching, and then you have assignments to complete. And I wanna make sure that those are done. And then we'll have two group teleconference calls per month. And that's like a time for us all to kind of come together 
and connect and have personal support and sharing and all of that. So that's been a request people have made for me because my seminars end up being like multiple hours long otherwise. So I'm going to be doing everything through videos that are delivered to you at the beginning of the week. And then we have the group teleconference calls to connect. And usually those are more like, I know I'm kind of being didactic here and I've just been the one speaking, but when you're in a private group, they're more like circles where everybody's getting to share like what's going on for them, where you're able to get personal support, personal coaching, personal Akashic healing. Sometimes we do things as a group, but it's a, a time and a place for us to connect and integrate and have the support that we all need to really embody these lessons and embody these teachings. So that's how it will work. Uh, there's also uh, healing transmissions that come. And right now, there are five that I'm planning for the full three month journey. And these are done through, uh, if you've never received one of my healing transmissions, these are Akashic Records upgrades and you get like an audio file that's kind of like guided shamanic journey. And then I also do like prayer and ceremony work for everybody in the course. And we kind of all have a day where we're going to receive this upgrade. It's usually Sundays in the evening and, and we work on that healing. So these are healing transmissions, Akashic records upgrades where you're getting the download from the, from the lineage right now, there are five that are planned that could change. So sometimes I get, more guidance once I'm in, in, you know, delivery of the content and then more stuff comes in. The other thing too, is that there are going to be some guest teachers and guest. um, the guests are going to be in the realm of like Tantra and sacred sexuality and, um, mystery school tradition, specifically like the Egyptian one. So we, you may, you may also have guest teachers and for them, when the guest teachers come on, those will also be conference calls, like bonus conference calls. Um, I'm just seeing if there are any questions. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask? I don't even know how I would see if people have questions. I think there's a way for you to raise your hand because we've got, you know, still a little over 30 people on the call. But if you, if you have a question, if you want to ask it, this is the time to ask it. Or you can always email me if you'd like to set up like a consultation, if you'd like to see if this is right for you. There's actually a link on the um, the Out of Egypt page where you can click that and get taken to my calendar where you can book in a time. You can also email me, Kara, K-A-R-A, at wakingbeauty.com. And one new message. So Esther says, is the Out of Egypt series connected with the Sacred Wealth Academy and does one support the other? Yes, indeed. So basically Out of Egypt is like the core kind of initiation into the Hathor mysteries and the Venus path and the focus of what we're learning in the realm of like facilitation is more based in relationships and sacred sexuality. And it's really on like the ascend, ascending the sacred prostitute path, like out of the wounds and into the power. So that is going on in out of Egypt. Sacred Wealth Academy is also the Hathor Mystery School, but it is focused in wealth and business. So it's very specific to realizing Venus in the realm of mon your relationship to money and your relationship to business and like building an empire. I want you guys to know, like, so I'll just say this. Um, the, um, 
the whole entire Hawthorne Mystery School is incredibly vast. So, you know, there were midwives that worked under Hawthorne. Obviously, like, I'm not a midwife, so I do not teach midwifery. You, however, might be a midwife, and you might also be a priestess of Hawthorne, right? So midwives that worked under Hawthorne. There were sound healers. You know, there you could go into Hawthorne. Actually, I would just suggest you check out Tom Kenyon's work if you want to get all into the Hawthorne mysteries on sound and toning and you know, healing through sound and the sound technologies in ancient Egypt were tremendous. So obviously that's not my specialty either. So, you know, go, you go to Tom Kenyon for that. In fact, there are 12 paths that are under Hathor. And I am not, I don't teach all of the 12 paths, but I do teach the overarching mystery school traditions, the overarching, will learn about the, all the 12 paths in, um, in out of Egypt. And then I'm a specialist in particular in the, basically like there were some Hathor priestesses and priests that were trained specifically like in working with the king and the queen and the uh, initiation of the pharaoh and that, that were more like the men to like the sacred you know wealth and power tradition so particularly my soul has a particular gifting with that and that's been like where i focus most of my effort so you if you want to study with me in that that's going to be the sacred wealth academy and i'll just like put these links right here um but yes the two are connected and the other thing is that your investment in um if you want to take out of egypt you can apply at least 997 of the investment to off your tuition to the Sacred Wealth Academy if you want to do the Academy in the fall when that opens. So I'm just going to put the links in the comments. All right. So, um, I know we've been on for a while. I know my phone almost died. It's been such a pleasure to see you guys and to be with you here today. Um, I really appreciate this time. I would say that, you know, tonight is the new moon. So really take this opportunity to, you know, integrate what we've covered, journal afterwards, really connect to divine sensuality, connect to you know, looking at your life and where are, where can you elevate, like where can you elevate your relationship to the material realms, bringing it into harmony, bringing it into the light of your divine, you know, mother consciousness and really enjoy. And I just want to say, I love you guys so much. I see, I see so many people here who are really dear to my heart and um, thank you for sharing. Thank you for holding this space. And I hope you guys have like a really, really beautiful evening and a wonderful close to the spring and the start of the summer. And please get in touch with me. I'll put my email here. If you have any other questions. And yes, Marina, there will be a replay sent out. So I'm going to um, close us with a prayer. The Sacred Mother, Divine Goddess Hathor, thank you so much for all of the blessings, all of the benedictions, all of the grace that you have given in this seminar to all of us here today. And I pray and I ask that you really, really awaken and come to those who are meant to be yours, who are meant to remember 
the beauty and the wisdom and the grace that you infuse all of us with continuously. And we just ask that on this new moon, you bless all of us with an infusion of your beauty and your wisdom and your divine sensuality and your sacred grace and the purity of our bodies, the purity of our hearts and minds and bring us into that divine union. And I just ask that you safeguard and protect like all of the wisdom that is shared here today. If there have been any thoughts or projections of negativity which have come up to be healing, we erect now a beautiful, glorious tree of light. And this is multidimensional, so it's for anybody who has watched this seminar today or past, present, future timelines will watch it. And we allow all of those judgments and really all of the pain, the whore of Babylon label, the false idol label, the, the you know, the slurs and the traumas of the temple that have happened. We send all of that deeply now into the roots of this tree of life, allowing it to be fertilizer, allowing it to become composted through the power of the mother's love. And we let ourselves bloom. May the return of the temple come. We know it is time. There have been so many signs, the burning of Notre Dame. We know it's time for these mysteries. We know it's time for this tradition to reemerge, to bless the world during this time. And we just thank you. Thank you, thank you for holding this space for us. And so it is. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. Bye guys. I hope you have an amazing week and blessings of the mother be with you. Ciao.